Hello everyone and welcome to CEO Journals. I'm your host Ethan Bridge and today's show is actually my first podcast interviewing more than one person at the same time. I have the pleasure in speaking to both Dmitry Dragolev and Corey McAvini, the husband and wife behind the company Just Reach Out. Dmitry Dragolev is the founder of Just Reach Out, a DIY PR software platform which to date has helped over 5,000 businesses and brands get featured in the press all by themselves. The last project he worked on was with a company named Polar, which he scaled from 0 to 40 million page views in a few years and was then acquired by Google. Demetrius spent over a decade in the world of marketing and was previously a software engineer. He has published over 1,500 articles and he writes for Forbes, Entrepreneur, The Next Web, Business Insider and so many others. Dimitri loves working with customers looking to independently control their SEO, content marketing and PR, all with a focus on relationship building. In his free time, he blogs on his personal site, Criminally Prolific, and interviews folks like Neil Patel, Tim Ferriss and Dan Martell. Dimitri's wife, Corey McAvini, is the head of growth at Just Reach Out, where she specialises in content, community and of course outreach. She spends a third of her day connecting with customers and making sure they're getting featured in the press. Another third, examining news headlines and dreaming up world content ideas for our customers. And another third, so she says, snacking. Previously, Corey was an employee at Culture Amp, where she held roles in marketing, then sales, and then customer service. Corey left Culture Amp in 2018 when she decided to make her late night kitchen table strategy sessions with her husband official by joining Just Reach Out full time. Obviously, this is my first podcast interviewing more than one person, so I hope I've managed to grasp the right dynamic, making the interview as valuable as possible. So without further ado, let's dive straight into the episode. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the CEO Journals podcast. Today on the show, I'm lucky enough to be talking to Dimitri and Corey. How are you both doing today? Good, good. Doing well. Fine, thanks. (laughs) I'm super excited for this episode because it's my first episode where I've had more than two people. So not just myself and another, we've got three people on today's episode, which is awesome. And they're in fact a couple. Again, a first. What's what, what to know? So if you would like to give me a quick 60 second introduction of who you are and what you do. So that's both of you. All right. You want to go first? Sure. Right. So... <laughs> Uh, I'm Corey McAvini, and I run Just Reach Out with my husband, Dimitri Dragolev. And typically, we, in a, in a day-to-day basis, we teach entrepreneurs and marketers how to do their own PR. Um, awesome. Yeah. And I'm Dimitri Dragolev. I'm the founder of Just Reach Out, or I'm Just Reach Out with Corey, uh, my wife. And um, yeah, we help entrepreneurs pitch journalists and get press and figure out how to do this all on their own. That sounds it. <laughs> I can give you that's, more. Of my yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That sounds awesome. I can't wait to delve deeper into that, but there is a way I like to start all my episodes and I like to throw it back with my guests and ask them about their time at school. So let's focus on the 15 year old versions of yourself. How did you both find school? Were you straight A students or were you the class clowns that sat at the back and didn't really care in lessons? How did you find school? Oh, it was tough for me. <laughs> I came here from Russia. And I was 11. Um, half my family came, half have been. And then from like 11 to pretty much college, I just tried to figure out like uh, the language first I didn't speak, then the culture, then like foods and like how you're supposed to dress, anything from taking a shower every day to like wearing a t-shirt and then pants versus a button down shirt and you know, khakis and a nice suspender outfit <laughs> going on <laughs> to like how to properly converse with people, smiling at people. Just the whole shebang, really, yeah. <laughs> American lifestyle, Western lifestyle. So it was pretty, just a lot of adaptation to, like, learning the culture, uh, essentially. Wow. And we actually, <laughs> we, we grew up um, in New Hampshire in the same town, but we went to different high schools. And um, I, I was the opposite of Dimitri. I was a social butterfly. I had tons of friends in high school. I'm still friends with many of them. 
and I just really enjoyed high school a lot. I enjoyed everything. Um, cool. And, and I was not a straight A student at all um, because I just enjoyed doing too many other things in addition to it. I couldn't. Make, I had to make time for. I had several jobs. Um, so I, I was always working. Too. I got really good grades in math, and I just sucked at everything else. <laughs> <laughs> everything else. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I couldn't speak English. Or anything. That must have been super difficult for you to fit in at such a young age as well, and coming into such a new environment. How did yeah. you find it at first? Was it? Did you instantly make friends, or were you sort of really quite reserved about how you got involved in things? I was pretty reserved. You'll hear some banging. We have like some people that are actually fixing up our house that we just bought. Uh, we're working out of our house, so we apologize in advance. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I was really reserved and didn't talk to people and tried to figure out what I should say. Um, everybody looked different than me. They spoke different language. And, I just felt like an outsider for a really, really long time. Um, but eventually, I started, like, I had, like, a friend who was also a loner. And <laughs> it's just, like, this guy, Phil Collard. And we're both equally pathetic, you know, uh, <laughs> being made fun of for random stuff, you know. Uh, I tried to get attention from people any way I could. That's super interesting though, because it's the it's the opposite of what you do now. Like <laughs> yeah. you reserved, but now you're helping people talk to everybody. So <laughs> where did that where did that change? I don't know. Like I guess well the big change for me was when I was working at as a software developer and I kept going to introvert crowd. I got computer science, software developer, introvert, introvert, introvert. And then one day I came in, looked around, I was like, Oh, all these people are old. I don't want to be like them. They seem like they're just going to die in this big company. And I was like, I can't do the corporate thing. And this whole like non-conversing, non-talking to people is just going to kill me. <laughs> so I decided to try and switch careers, but I didn't know how. But I was like, I got to do something, right? And that's when Corey was thinking about going to California because she found a school for her trade policy degree. And I was like, this will be a perfect way to just leave everything I have behind and figure out how to do marketing and maybe like Silicon Valley is nearby. There's a lot of people there that know what they're doing. <laughs> so, Corey, why don't you tell me a little bit about how you guys met? Because obviously you lived in the same town, but you went to different schools. How did you two come together? Uh, it was years after I had left New Hampshire it was after college, a um, few years, quite a few years after college, and I was living in Boston, and I just decided it was time to um, date more seriously, and so I tried eHarmony, and this was before eHarmony or any dating sites were something that you ever talked about, and so people started asking me, like, how did you meet Dimitri? And I was like, oh, he's from my hometown. We just ran into each other. And we didn't, set, we didn't really tell a lot of people how we actually met um, because we met on eHarmony, and it was 2005, 2006. Yeah, it was, it was before people were admitting they were online dating. And now that's so normal. Like, it's, a lot, so many people meet it's on online It's actually more now. effective, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure so did you were you both always entrepreneurial did you always want to work for yourselves did you always not want to work for someone else well like at that point when I was at work and I was like I'm gonna quit and figure out what to do next I really thought I was reading this web 2.0 magazine and I thought oh I'm gonna be like those entrepreneurs and those web 2.0 magazines like running their own companies they're so young so cool uh, and I want to just kind of have control. So um, I kind of set out for that goal back then. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I knew like it'll be because it was like the ultimate golden dream coming to US, you know, having like a business. I've never known anybody who had a business before. 
So it seems so foreign and out of reach that I kind of wanted to go after it. And, um, so that was the time. And in, in the U.S., childcare and just par parenting while working is extremely difficult. It, it's amazing that anybody has children in America to me. It, and um, just the system works against you to really enjoy the role of being a parent. Um, and it's just, it's just not conducive to working effectively while, while also being able to fit time in to pick, pick your kids up from school or go to their soccer practice or whatever. Um, and so I've just wanted to have complete control over that. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to be my own boss. I love that. And that's something I want to ask you about, because obviously you do have kids, but you are both working on the same company. So how do you find that time balance? How do you find the time to obviously have quality time with your children, but also work and grow your business? We, we work in sprints. Um, okay. Years ago, when the like the 90 minute sprint became popular, we started testing that out and experimenting with it. We're, we're always been fans of um, the, the Tim Ferriss way of work and just squeezing in exactly what you have to do today and right now and forgetting about the rest of it and looking at what your long-term goals are and making sure that what you're doing really contributes to those long-term goals. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, that means, um, you know, I focus on sales um, and I, I do a lot of content development for the, the customers on our platform, a lot of onboarding and customer experience stuff type stuff. And Dimitri focuses quite a bit on, on business development and, and then the engineering, of course. Yeah, over the last five years, I just realized that I don't need, or usually people don't need nine to five, usually. It's just so much time gets wasted that if you boil it down to actual work people accomplish, people talk about it, they kind of read it, and then they go back to their own way of doing things, because and, and they waste time, all, obviously, all the time. So you just literally just 90 minutes spent, what do you have to get done today, Otherwise, like this thing's gonna fall apart or something, and just do that part today, and then everything else is just second priority. You know, you don't need to have it in Bob's ear. You don't need to get, answer all your messages. You don't need to send texts to everybody, respond to everybody there. And you don't need to be hard about hard on yourself about not getting to it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I think that's the hardest part because culturally, we're so used to uh, the fact that. It, companies have told us for so long you need to sit at a desk or you need to be out in the field and you need to work these hours and from you know sun up to sundown your hours and and I just refuse to accept and that. And the biggest thing too is this how we sped up our system like our society is so sped up now everybody's kind of follow and one up everybody so if you're seeing that your competitors have more customers you're, oh, I need to have more customers, or you're seeing that your peers are working more than you think, oh, I gotta work just like them. And it's not the case. Like, you just make up your own life. So, like, if, you know, your priority is family and life and spending quality time with your partner and, like, your, your kids, then you make that your priority and everything else is secondary. So, yeah, you wanna grow your business, but yeah, you want to also spend time with your loved ones and your kids. And you just prioritize things in your mind differently and focus on things differently and dedicate your time differently. It's just, I don't know, it's just a different mentality, you know, go to, against the society of preconception. Kind of. No, for sure. And with these 90 minute sprints and what you do within your work, how do you set your priorities? So what would go to the top of your list, whereas what would be at the bottom? One of our main focus points has always been retention. Um, it's easy for us to get users on our platform, um, but with any software business, getting folks to really use it and engaging people, keeping them excited about your product is really challenging. So um, we might do a, a sprint to focus on what type of conversations we need to be having with customers or what we can do to 
kind of keep keep them excited about um, our offering. And so we we you know we'll come up with a plan and every day chip away at it. Um, and and connecting with with customers is a big one um, for us. Yeah, we, you just have like an overarching goal that you're working towards for like a quarter or so. And then you just work towards that, whether it's like a sales number or a retention metric. Uh, for me, usually, I mean, I, I try and dedicate like maybe 30 minutes out of the day to just check in with our development team or our team overseas that does customer support, make sure that they have everything they need. Sort of like a daily stand up, but it's not a daily check in. It's like just a message or something like that. And then just focus on that goal that one thing that you kind of need to drive that metric and what are the tasks that you must accomplish today um, and then we have a hard stop at like 2 30 or so to pick up kids and that's really like the rest of the day is pretty much done I, your brain melts at that point you're not doing any <laughs> yeah. real work like sometimes Corey might hang out with kids and i might just look at other work that i haven't finished for an hour or two but we don't work at night um, it just kills your brain and just makes you very miserable. You can't sleep afterwards very well. Just really bad for your health in general. <laughs> so we and just. I, and I think it's really good because you found a way that works for you two as well. You found a way that balances your time for everyone. It often feels like bare bones and we're scraping by, and you know, our kids have a meltdown the same day that inevitably that something goes wrong at work you know mm -hmm. and it, it everything happens all at once um yeah but yeah stepping away from it all it's like it's doable <laughs> yeah we've been doing just fine um and we work way less than anybody else out there i feel like we've met <laughs> i haven't met anybody who works as much as we do and as little as little as <laughs> little not as much I like that you admit that, though. Yeah. I wish I wish more people would be um, would test it out. if yeah. they, if they had the the it's it's a luxury. It really is. Time boxing it and just but it's always like everybody wants to get more done. Like everybody wants to answer all the emails. Everybody wants to do more reaching out because if you don't, then somebody else will, and they'll take your customer. They'll take your partnership. Like, it's just like everybody's pushing ahead further and trying to accomplish more and earn more money and get a bigger acquisition. And, you know. No, definitely. <laughs> I agree. So we've, we've scratched the surface on what you do, but I actually want to dive into the specifics. And I think you've, you've touched on you are heavily involved in PR. And I think we throw these acronyms around like everyone knows what they mean and what they entail. So for the listeners, can you just give a brief overview on what PR actually is and some of the methods and practices behind it? PR uh, really is an archaic practice these days that most people don't understand properly, right? It used to be the fact that like, you take one message, whatever you have, the news, and you send it to all the journalists out there covering a specific industry. And you create these news releases, and these journalists will look at them, and maybe they look at the news, they'll read through it, this release, and they might cover this topic. Uh, this dates back to, like, these leaflets that people used to kind of carry around from place to place kind of announcing the news. And... These days, it just doesn't work that way. People still run PR releases. They've held pre-hour newswire. These companies, tons of money to send these out. And they also have the same mentality still. You know, you talk to a typical company that hires a PR firm these days. It's still that archaic, horrible way of doing PR. It's, you know, one message to thousands of people, thousand journalists to try and get them to cover the you with this, you know, this news that you have, right? And what we're trying to show people with our tool to help them understand with our tool and educate them with our course and all the materials, resources, is it's a personalized conversation starter with a journalist who is highly interested in what you have to say. And that personalized conversation starter must add, start like a real conversation 
with a person, not as if you're standing on a sidewalk and trying to advertise something be to buy something from you, like on New York City or London or wherever. Um, you, you're not an advertisement. And so that's the paradigm shift that we're trying to like instill on our customers, people that come our way, whether it's through our blog or our you know, like our SaaS, our product, but um, it's hard. It's like an uphill battle a lot of times because you still have people coming back and saying, but I have this list of 150 journalists I want to upload it to your tool and I want to pitch all of them. We're saying, no, 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 our tool will only find the most relevant journalists, let you strike up their personalized conversation starter and all that. Um, but yeah, our tool helps you pitch journalists just in a different way. <laughs> okay, so who are your typical clients? Marketers, agencies, uh, you know, you have marketing agencies that do PR outreach or any kind of outreach, SEO or content agencies or consultants. Uh, who are doing outreach to do guest posting, to get links, to get mentions. Um, and these could be outside agencies or consultants that are servicing brands, or it could be like actual brands, actual products, custom, you know, like companies that are doing outreach. But the people who use our software are marketers, really. You know. They're oftentimes marketers who don't have a background in PR, but they've been tasked with, okay, here, oversee the marketing, the content, the SEO, and add PR to your plate. But they don't necessarily know anything about PR, and our tool just streamlines the process. For sure. So, okay, then. So a client comes to you. What are the action, actionable steps that your software takes to take that client from nothing to where they want to be? So a lot of folks don't know where to begin and we've created a strategy and action plan builder where they answer nine questions about their campaign about their goals um, and really what what they're looking for and then they get this magical strategy um, page that tells them exactly what preliminary research steps they need to take to prepare for their campaign because a lot of people think oh I'm going to start a PR campaign I'm just going to start sending pitches to journalists but they don't know um, which keywords they should be targeting they don't know what type of content they should be putting out they don't understand um, how to build their own media list if that's even necessary and what the most effective outreach tactics will be in order to meet their goals so our strategy kind of distills all that and breaks it down in a digestible format and provides them with the outreach tactics that will be most effective for them. And then we also provide folks with an action plan that's a week-by-week -week schedule of what types of outreach activities or research they should be performing. Um, and that that gets them going, it gets them started. Because their PR campaign is really an experiment and it tests out different subject lines, different angles, um, and different outreach methods. So depending on the success of a small batch of pitches, you'll have an idea um, fairly quickly of what's working and what isn't working based on the number of opens and responses that you get. And that's, we, we just kind of, tell people what to do every step of the way. Awesome. And something I like finding out about these products when you take someone from start to finish is some of the most successful stories you've had. So what is, some, what is one of the greatest success stories you guys have had with your product, whether that's for yourselves internally or the actual people that you're servicing? Some of the most successful customers are those who come to us with data, especially if the data is highly localized um, and if it pertains to a certain community or a certain geographic region. If folks have data that's really valuable to the media, um, they can reach out to different broadcast networks based on cities or, or different um, states or different countries and, and see who's interested in those stories. Um, and certain investigative reporters are, you know, track those types of stories. 
Um, another type of customer that we see a lot of success with are those who come to us without any brand visibility and we quickly teach them how to skill up their guest posting and their content management skills. So they, they bring to us some ideas and they might have a product or a service that they want to promote, but they don't know how to get started. So we tell them exactly the steps they need to take to take their blog to the next level um, with a little SEO and PR and content tweaking. Right, we have a telemarketing app, Stopper, and a rubble killer basically. It stops telemarketing calls. It's an app on your iPhone, and they've been with us for years. And <clears throat> to Corey's first point, uh, they have amazing data on all these telemarketing calls that are coming their way that they're blocking. And then for each city, each state. And so what they've been doing is they've been pitching specific news stations at small cities with this data. And this approach is so replicable, so consistent over and over and over. You can just go to town on it for years and years and years and get more and more and more press because you generate more and more data. And to Corey's second point about figuring out the editorial and content, we have a customer who specializes in fraud and uh, it's mainly construction equipment rentals. So it's very specific. And he's been able to just write about this one topic and constantly come up with new ideas around how this fraud is detected, how do this combat it and this topic is something that keeps developing more and more and so what he has picked as a content idea can constantly be written more and more you know more details about it um, so there's just some ideas you know as types of customers that we have and how they think about PR you know success that they're constantly getting you know being published constantly both of them are in press pretty much weekly which is crazy so hypothetically if there was a guy with a podcast who interviewed entrepreneurs what would you tell that guy on how to promote his podcast <laughs> sure yeah i mean the very first thing for you uh, or anybody who's doing this <laughs> uh i would guess right so who are the guests and what are the networks they have that overlap with your listeners so uh is it the people that you interview should be people that are excited to promote it among their networks, promote the interviews themselves, and in turn, gain you more uh, visibility for your podcast. And the other thing is podcast listeners love other podcasts, right? And so uh, being a guest yourself uh, on other shows, um, again, helps you gain the podcast listeners uh, for your podcast as kind of like and vice versa as well so yeah it's just following other guests making sure that they're promoting these podcast episodes also making sure that you're a guest on other podcast episodes and i would add if, of, if you're not already um taking the transcripts from your interviews and turning them into blog posts Oh, yeah. Well, doing like a whole SEO strategy on ranking for specific uh, key terms, you know, because you have like uh, names of guests, you can even rank for those names with your podcast. So for Dimitri Dragon and Corey McAvini, you can probably rank for that key term if you title things correctly and you have a pretty good blog post summarizing the key insights, things like that. Um, so you can start pulling traffic that way too being highly targeted towards the keywords of the guests right that you're interviewing um, the the hypothetical podcast host has taken note yeah. <laughs> but, but one thing i also want to talk about then is seo blows my brain i have no idea i hear about it everywhere so give us a quick overview on what seo involves and how you actually rank because i'm sure a lot of people think about seo as what the hell is that like yeah. I hear it everywhere, yeah. I want to know to rank, but how the <laughs> hell do I? It's something I fell into like 11 years ago or so, and I just perfected this process. Uh, and 
it's search engine optimization. It's that idea of you ranking on Google, right? And um, there's a science to doing that. You can't gamify it a lot. A lot of people think that you can gamify the whole thing. You can't really do that. You, basically, the way I see it is when you go to court and you present a case and you say, I'm a podcast host, I think this search term on Google has a hole in it, uh, meaning it, it's, it's poor search results, and I deserve to be on there. And um, I deserve to be on there, and here's my case. And you list out why your content deserves to be on there. It could be that the content there is outdated, maybe it's poor usability on the pages, maybe something else is up, but you have a strong case, and the jury rules in your favor. If that's the case, then you should probably rank on there and you should go and execute a campaign around trying to rank there. Um, the way you rank on Google is that's the first qualifier. You create a piece of content that's better than whatever is ranking there on the first page. The second one is really, are you in the same popularity wise? Are you in the same category, right? So if everybody on there is kind of Forbes an entrepreneur, right? And you're, just a small blog that's getting started or like a medium-sized blog. You can't compete with a lot of those folks, right? It's very hard. Uh, but if you're in the same popularity level and you use something called a domain authority ranking, it's between zero and a hundred. But if you're about the same or you're a little bit lower, but you're not, you know, like 50 lower than whatever is up there, then you should have a decent shot at going after it. And really the third is that outreach where you're trying to gain links to point to that piece of content. So you created that piece of content on your page. You want that piece of content to rank your, your, your web page, your section of your web page, you know. And, um, and, and so you do outreach to try and get links to that main piece of content. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of a process there involved of trying to get people to say yes to you. In your case, you might be doing outreach to get interviews on other podcasts. When you get interviews on other podcasts, they link to your site, and they can link to that specific page within your site, and that might, that's something that you might ask them to do when you do that outreach because you're trying to rank for that one specific keyword after they do your interview. You, know. um, you might also reach out and ask your guests to write for their blogs, and when you do that, then the guest might say yes because you already know each other a little bit. And then when you write for those blogs, you will backlink inside the article to your main piece of content on your site that you want to rank. So it's kind of like, it's a little bit involved once you start talking about this stuff. It's a process. Give him a timeline so that he has an yeah. idea of how long does it take to rank. Like three months, uh, like sometimes two months, you know. Uh, but sometimes one. And it depends on how competitive your keyword is. Too. Yeah. I find it all really interesting because as you say, it is a process. And at the end of the day, it's free traffic. You're not, it's not paid search. You, this is yeah. something that people should definitely be investing their time in because if they can yeah. end up ranking and they're on that first page of Google, they're not paying for mm -hmm. those clicks. They're not paying for those visitors. So Yes. I, need to, I need to learn more. <laughs> I need to put my research in. I know we're short for time as 2.30 is coming up. And I heard earlier that's pick up kid time. So there yeah. is, I will, I will round off because I have three questions at the end of all my episodes that I like to ask all my guests. And they're in relation to three topics I don't think are spoken about enough. And they are money, relationships, and death. I know death down, sounds a bit morbid to end off the episode, but it's a really interesting question and I love the answers I get. Okay. But the first question with relation to money, I personally don't think it directly relates to money, money and success. But the question is, what does the word success mean to you two? Uh, success, just having less stress uh -huh. in your life. I think it's success. Being able to sleep at night. Yeah. Just I like that. <laughs> less stress in your life. Like the least amount of stress among all your friends and loved ones, you know. If you got the least amount of stress, I think you're succeeding. I think I think a lot of people, especially in the US, but everywhere today, um, 
are very competitive when it comes to finances, personal or business. And at the end of the day, if you can go to bed and, and without worrying and, and stay asleep without waking up and having anxiety, that's, um, that's a lot of success. In today's because, society. In today's society, because there's very little space for um, not thinking about that stuff and being able to turn it off. For sure, because yeah. especially when you're business owners as well, it's all on you. So if you can stay calm as the owner, then, then that's only going to rub off on your team and everyone else around you. So I like that. Simple, but perfect. The next question in relation to relationships, I know we've already touched on it and we've touched on the fact that you're a couple, you've got kids and how you manage your time around that. But throughout your journey so far, have you found it difficult to maintain your relationships with friends and family or have you found ways to bring those people along with you? Uh, it, I think it's most challenging. Um, our kids are, are young still and we're just really tired by the time the weekend comes. And we want to socialize and we want to do things. And even this past weekend was challenging because um, Dimitri said, oh, let's, let's go here and do this or let's have a play date and see these friends. But I just said, no, I'm too tired. And the kids, their behavior is horrible right now. They're exhausted. We need to just do nothing. And it's really hard for us as adults to do nothing when we're, we're so used, we're programmed to fit in as much as possible. Um, that's yeah. the biggest challenge. And also just working toward, on relationships in general. I feel like people don't think of relationships as something you work on. You just kind of like, hey, what's up, man? What's going on? It's been three months. I haven't talked to you. What, 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 let's meet up. And, and then two months later, you do something else. It's not like you, you, you kind of need to keep working at relationships you want to maintain. So you need you to need follow to up. I think you're going to build an app around this. No, I don't know. And even like uh, with your wife or your significant other, you don't, like the relationship just kind of starts veering, veering all the time. So you have to keep like um, re-engaging and working on that relationship to make sure that it, you're, you know, like that relationship is stronger. Your loved ones, your family, friends, I feel like the same. You pick the ones you want to keep building those relationships with. Obviously, it's like impossible to do with everybody or even more than, say, 10 people. It's very hard. But you try and do your best and you just pick the ones who you like, actively work on them. Um, Definitely. And I couldn't agree more with everything both of you have just said there. And definitely need to work on what you want to keep. Otherwise, it will go. So yeah. I like that you added that. So my final question to round off today's episode is, are you afraid of dying? <laughs> um, I'm not afraid of it. I just want to make sure that I don't have any like re big regrets towards the end of my life just because, um, you know, like you just don't want to like miss stuff in your life and then be towards the end of it and not uh like i don't know i guess it's like very generic to say that but you just want to make sure you're spending your time wisely at each and every year of your life so that by the time you're towards the end of it you're like you pretty much done everything you wanted to do you know <laughs> so every day is a bucket list checkoff opportunity bucket list checkoff opportunity yeah you know skydiving maybe kissing a stranger you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> i don't know Corey's thinking, why, have you, why have you said that one no, no, thank you thank random. you guys random. Just random. <laughs> thank you guys and again amazing answers throughout the whole episode i've learned so much and so is that hypothetical podcast host so definitely going to take note on those things but where can the listeners follow up follow up with you if they've got any questions what is where can they find your product tell tell them everything our software tool is on justreachout.io awesome yep. and then criminallyprolific.com is my personal site if you want to Chat. learn more you have a lot of blog posts there blog posts on seo and all that stuff i will be reading those 
<laughs> but I will leave them in the show notes below for the listeners that didn't catch that. So don't worry if you didn't remember. But Corey and Dimitri, thank you so much for your time. And I hope everyone enjoyed this episode of the CEO Journals. Thank you, So that's going to wrap up today's episode of the podcast and I can't thank you all enough for listening. I aim to interview some of the most incredible business owners and entrepreneurs every single week. So you can really help me out by smashing that subscribe button and by leaving me a five star review over in the iTunes store. It literally takes two seconds and will help me secure some of the greatest names in business as guests on the show. Make sure you tune into the next episode where I'm going to be talking to another incredibly interesting guest. I'll be discussing their journey and providing tips to all your aspiring and current business owners. Have a lovely rest of your day. And once again, thank you for tuning in to CEO Journals.